Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Sally Wheeler, and I'm Dean of the ANU College of Law and the university's Pro Vice-Chancellor for International Strategy. I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Philippa Weeks Lecture, Industrial Relations on the Brink. I would like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose land we gather today. And for those of us in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge and extend a special welcome to members of the Weeks family who are here with us tonight. We're delighted to be joined by Ian Hancock, Pat and John Weeks, Alison Weeks and Elizabeth Weeks. Every year we invite an esteemed expert in labour law to deliver the Philippa Weeks lecture. This event is to honour the legacy of the late Professor Philippa Weeks, who was an Associate Dean head of school and beloved friend, colleague and alumna here at the college. She was one of Australia's leading labour law scholars. Her work made a significant contribution to how we currently understand the subject. Now for many academics, myself included, they would be proud if that was their legacy. But Philippa Weeks is a much more significant figure than that. She changed the lives of students she taught and colleagues she worked with. When I introduce myself to alumni as the Dean of the ANU Law, I am more often than not told that Philippa's contribution to their education and their time at ANU was transformative. She made them get law. She made them stay in the course. She made them a much better lawyer. She took so much time with me is a reoccurring theme. That is what it's all about as an academic. And Philippa is a towering example to all of us about what we should try and do. I'd like now to introduce tonight's speaker, the Honourable Jeff Judice. Jeff Judice AO was appointed President of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission by the Howard government in 1997. He previously had a career as an industrial relations practitioner, solicitor and barrister. He was appointed the first president of the Fair Work Commission by the Rudd government in 2009, and he retired in 2012. He's an honorary professorial fellow in the Centre for Employment and Labour Relations Law at the Melbourne Law School and chairs a number of boards. He's written extensively on the Australian industrial relations system. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Jeff to deliver this evening's lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wheeler, for that kind introduction. Could I also thank you all for journeying to this part of cyberspace. Uh, industrial relations has elements of human relations, politics, economics, current affairs, uh, a mixture which makes it fascinating. And people with a deep interest in industrial affairs make up a community of sorts. I'm grateful that so many of you have turned up, so to speak, to hear the thoughts of an IR veteran. I'd also like to acknowledge the late Philippa Weeks and the honour of delivering the annual lecture which bears her name. She was a very well respected academic and administrator at ANU and is remembered with great affection by all those who knew her. As 2020 lumbers to a close, a year like no other any of us has experienced, there are three things in particular that dominate industrial relations. First, the very dramatic and sudden change in our economy brought about by the pandemic. Unemployment, layoffs, whole industries virtually shut down and no certainty when things might get back to normal. A significant recession and no end in sight. The second thing is the ongoing dialogue between, between employers, unions and government concerning industrial relations regulation. The joint working group process stretched over many months. For the most part, confidentiality has been maintained and participants have resisted the temptation to justify their proposals through the media. One hopes the process yields a sustainable agreement on key points. The recent history of industrial relations in Australia has been punctuated by a number of major legislative reforms. In 1993, the Commission's compulsory arbitration powers were significantly reduced and enterprise bargaining was formally recognised. 
1996 legislation provided for simplification of awards and introduced Australian workplace agreements. Uh, in 1996, and uh, I'm sorry, then there was work choices in 2005 and the Fair Work Act in 2009. In 1996 and 2005, conservative approaches held sway, but the tide turned somewhat in 2009, and many provisions from the work choices legislation were repealed or modified. In between these major changes, there were a number of attempts to, to alter the system, which failed for lack of political support. Attempts at reform, successful or otherwise, have all kinds of costs. Particularly wasteful is the pen pendulum swing of enactment and repeal, which we've grown accustomed to. These costs could be avoided if parties were prepared to compromise. Stability in the system should be given a higher value. The third thing is how our award system will react to and accommodate COVID-19. It seems to me there are two types of issues to consider here. The first is the changes to work patterns and arrangements necessary to stop the spread of the virus itself. This involves things like mask wearing, testing, social distancing, absence while waiting test results and so on. These matters obviously require sensitive handling. The second set of issues concerns remote working. Traditional timekeeping methods are a poor fit for a system which, in which working times are discretionary and may alter to fit domestic responsibilities such as childcare, school drop-offs, homeschooling, caring and partner support. Because of the need to make accommodations between work and family responsibilities, remote work is often not performed in neat morning and afternoon blocks with regulated meal breaks. Concepts like ordinary hours and overtime can't be rigidly applied. Work is fitted in at times of the day and week when domestic obligations allow. These new and varied ways of working also make it difficult for employers to record working time as they're required to do. Without a principled approach by both employer and employee, the trust necessary for the system to work will be absent. Although the issues will be starkest for award employees who are remunerated on a time basis, all employees will be affected to some extent. Against this background, I want to offer an assessment of how our system's operating and make some suggestions about the future. I shall start with employer and union representation. It's important to recognise that both employer and union representative bodies carry the burden of political affiliation. Employers mostly support the Conservative parties, the ACTU, the Labor Party. These alliances are seen as valuable because of the opportunity they provide to influence the legislative process. The prospect of preferment in government programs and opportunities to join government and other boards and committees. But there are also disadvantages. These linkages can produce an undesirable dependency on government. This dependency arises from the prospect of legislative assistance, money in the form of grants and subsidies for particular programs, and enhanced status for leaders of employer and union bodies. These things militate against sound policy development. Employer and union objectives sometimes have to be compromised to accommodate political considerations. Another result of political alignment is that small policy differences are very often exaggerated. Politicians highlight policy differences between themselves and their opponents, even where the differences are minor or easily reconcilable. My overall conclusion is that the alignment of employer and employee interest with the major political groupings hinders rather than assists bilateral approaches to industrial relations policy. Looking at employer representation specifically, it seems there's no preeminent employer representative body. There are at least three candidates for that title, as well as a small business confederation and a number of bodies representing industries or groups of industries. The membership of these bodies often overlaps. This is not really surprising or new. The history of employer participation in industrial policy making has generally been a history of disparate representation. 
Apart from national cases in the Fair Work Commission, in which the main employer representation tends to be through ACCI, there are multiple employer interests represented in policy debates, award matters, and representations to government. Patterns of employment, work locations, the proportion of overall costs constituted by labour costs, and a range of other considerations will vary from industry to industry and be reflected in employer policy for that industry. For example, employers in the retail industry are likely to treat labour costs as a top priority, while in resource industries, stability and predictability of labour costs might be more important. Given this situation, how well are employers organised to contribute to national policy formulation? I suggest not very well. The need to accommodate a range of interests tends to produce lowest common denominator policy positions. This is not to say employers cannot ever combine to produce a common position on a particular issue, but there is no doubt it's difficult, carries a risk of alienating parts of the constituency and requires strong leadership. This may also be a structural issue. There have been times in which employer voice was more unified, although never completely so. If employers wish to have a more effective voice in policy formulation, in my view, they must attempt to develop common positions which can be presented with authority. This requires a compromise of interests, perhaps unpalatable, but in my view, necessary. Looking at union representation, the ACTU has a long history of resolving differences between its union constituents to arrive at policies which are generally supported by the union movement. I do not underestimate the complexities of representing workers from a range of industries and occupations. Resolution of differences and compromise are still important elements in this process. It must also be said that whereas employer interests are conditioned by commercial and trading differences and intra-industry competition, employee interests tend to be more homogenous, remuneration, employment security, and so on. Unions are truly at a pivotal point. They've been greatly weakened in the last 20 years by reductions in numbers and the virtual collapse of enterprise bargaining. Wages growth has slowed, so as to be almost undetectable, except in pockets of the economy in which unions still have a strategic position. The causes of this decline in union influence, which has occurred in a number of other developed countries as well, are many. Collective approaches are simply not as popular as they once were. And rising affluence and increased levels of education have had an impact. Legislative, legislative restrictions on the right to strike in Australia, which have been the subject of adverse comment by the ILO for many years now, have not helped either. The circumstances in which industrial action is protected or lawful are tightly circumscribed. Apart from bona fide safety issues, protected action is only available in support of enterprise bargaining. The unions have been quite muted in their criticism of these restrictions, perhaps an indication that our industrial action regime has a degree of bipartisan acceptance. It is likely that the most important contributors to the decline of unions have been benign economic conditions and the increase in legislated entitlements. Most workers in Australia are entitled to minimum wages and other conditions set in awards, leave redundancy and other entitlements prescribed to the National Employment Standards, a near universal health insurance system and occupational superannuation paid for by their employer. Many of the usual or traditional reasons for joining unions are reduced in cogency when this array of basic protections is made available to all unionists and non-unionists. It seems that union influence on policy formulation now is exercised primarily through what is still sometimes referred to as the political wing of the labour movement, the ALP. The trade union movement has been weakened by the transfer of talented people out of the union movement and into politics. The ACTU and some individual unions have lost numerous of their leaders to national and state parliaments. 
In recent years, the ACTU has been a training ground for Labor politicians. Historically, the trade union movement has been very important in developing the standard of living we have today. Because of the collapse of its industrial power, the ability of the union movement to influence change is overly dependent on politicians and the political process. While politics has robbed the union movement of many talented leaders, it has also created powerful allies. State and federal Labor governments are by nature predisposed to union objectives. And the pre-selection system also tends to make Labor politicians responsive to union policies. To reiterate the point, because the union voice of itself has reduced in importance, it is dependent on politicians to amplify its voice. So what of the future for unions? Can they turn the current economic conditions to their advantage? The serious reversal of economic fortunes our society is experiencing gives unions an opportunity to refocus on the needs of the employees, low paid employees in particular, whose livelihoods are at risk. There are going to be many more workers in that category and they can benefit from the bargaining power that comes with a collective approach. This is, has been the traditional role of the union movement and it can be again. And perhaps somewhat perversely, the current economic conditions represent the best opportunity since the union decline commenced some 25 or more years ago for the unions to reverse their own fortunes. I want now to turn to the role of the Fair Work Commission. The role of the Fair Work Commission in industrial matters and the powers it should exercise have always been matters of controversy. Despite that, the part the Commission's played in Australia's economic, political and social history should be recognised. More recently, Australia's enjoyed a quarter century or more of uninterrupted economic growth with low inflation, relatively low unemployment and a rising standard of living underpinned by solid wages growth. We've been outstanding among the developed economies. The Commission has been an important part of the institutional framework during that period. Despite the ongoing criticisms of some commentators, the Commission's provided over an industrial relations system which has enhanced living standards. And while the Commission's power of compulsory arbitration of industrial disputes has been reduced, it continues to be a body of importance, not least because of the influence of the award system. As noted earlier, the pandemic poses challenges for award regulation in relation to work from home and similar arrangements. Work and domestic activities tend to uh, intermingle, making concepts of ordinary hours and overtime difficult to manage in some cases. Mandated working hours and breaks are largely unsupervised, despite the use of shared internet applications. It seems the Commission is responding to the change environment with cooperation from employers and unions, and has made a number of accommodative changes in award conditions. As we enter this period of pandemic induced award uh, induced recession, I have three observations to offer concerning the Commission's powers and functions. The first point is that the Commission's ability to deal with industrial problems has been restricted to a stage where the powers at its disposal are too constrained. The national employment standards can only be altered by legislation. The Commission has power to set and adjust entitlements in relation to a limited range of other matters, which it does in reviewing its awards or dealing with application to vary them. The Commission cannot exercise public interest-based discretion in setting wages and conditions generally or in dealing with industrial disputes. There is room for a cautious expansion of the Commission's general powers of arbitration. This would permit the Commission to respond quickly to emergent circumstances, certainly more quickly than the Parliament can. The exercise of powers in the public interest is part of a long tradition in the Commission 
with the potential to yield solutions which are practicable, durable and timely. The second observation concerns the calibre of appointees to the Commission. We need top quality appointments. The conditions of appointment of presidential members, other than the President, were downgraded in a major way by the Fair Work Act in 2009. Prior to that time, for more than a century, senior Commission members were accorded the same status as federal judges. With that status came judicial conditions such as a pension and enhanced long service leave. The Fair Work Act removed that status and those entitlements. A byproduct of the change was that the status of commission decisions was reduced in the court hierarchy and full bench decisions can now be challenged in most cases before a single judge of the federal court. In my view, judicial status should be restored to some senior positions in the commission to provide a core of members with superior legal skills. Unless this is done, top flight lawyers will not make themselves available for appointment. It was a mistake to downgrade legal skills 10 years ago, and it is not too late to repair the mistake. Legal training will continue to be very important in resolving the important legal issues coming before the Commission, particularly issues of jurisdiction. And without good legal minds, a hearing in the Commission might become just a preliminary step on a journey to the Federal Court uh, and might be said at several levels of the Federal Court as well. The third observation concerns the Commission's appeal jurisdiction. It appears that there is a limitation in the number of Commission members sitting on appeals on important legal questions or matters of general principle. At times, it seems that a special appeal division has been created. This approach has the intended benefit of consistency in decision making. In my respectful view, it also has a number of problems. The first is that appellants with a good argument that an earlier full bench decision should not be followed are often unable to get to first base because they find they're before an appeal bench comprised of some or all of the members who made the decision in question. This can lead to the impression that a fair hearing has been denied because the bench never opened its mind to the possibility of a different conclusion. The second problem is that limiting the composition of full benches in this way fails to make use of the talent and experience of a broader range of the Commission membership. Allied to that is the possibility that for some members, the only experience of appeals is receiving the pronouncement of appeal benches on their decisions. All members of the Commission should have equal access to appellate work for the sake of their own development as much as for the quality of appellate decision making. I admit there is much to be said for consistency, but on balance a broader participation in appeal work is to be preferred. I want to turn now to one of the central issues for Australia's economy, wages growth, in particular the lack of it. In recent years, growth in wages have been low. The Reserve Bank has lamented the stagnation of incomes and indicated that it is an undesirable situation. Economists are concerned for a number of reasons. Wages growth feeds into consumer spending, increased tax receipts, and tends to reduce government transfers. Therefore, provided they are not inflationary and do not impact on employment, wage increases contribute to a higher standard of living and promote economic activity. It seems that under current settings, the industrial relations system does not have an answer for the problematic level of wages growth. While the Commission has been pushing up minimum award wages in annual wage reviews for some years, these amounts are not reflected in wages growth for the economy as a whole. The possibility of union activity driving wages growth seems a very long shot given the collapse of enterprise bargaining and collective action generally. 
The late Professor Joe Isaac, in possibly his last published article, made a strong case for permitting industry bargaining as well as enterprise bargaining. He argued cogently that the features of our system, which made industry bargaining so economically dangerous 30 years ago, no longer exist. He pointed to overseas experience, particularly in Germany, to demonstrate the economic benefits of industry bargaining. While widening the scope of bargaining beyond individual enterprises has some risks, the suggestion deserves to be seriously considered. If the government takes the problem of low wages growth seriously, and all the indications are that it does, it is within its capability to influence market rates by lifting the cap on increases for public servants and others covered by government wages policy. Governments, including state governments incidentally, can have a big influence on private sector wages because of the pace setter effect of public se sector increases. For the current government to take this kind of action, it might have to override the opposition of a number of its supporters in the private sector, but the overall economic benefit might be worth it. Which brings me to enterprise bargaining. It is hard to know where to start. Apart from a few well-known areas of industry in which unions have a strategic presence, bargaining is not proceeding very effectively. The process for initiating protected action is a discouragement to strikes and bans. Where agreements are being renewed, they're often simply rolled over. We can expect that the trickle of enterprise bargaining cases in which employers seek a reduction in wages will increase as the recession takes hold. The boot, the better off overall test, is a sensible concept that has often failed to operate effectively. Many problems are the result of employer attempts to remove award restrictions by introducing rolled up rates or other similar devices in their agreements. There are some lengthy delays in the commission approval process and sometimes there are court challenges as well. It's important to employers and employees they know where they stand in, and in so many cases the enterprise bargaining system is failing to deliver certainty. While one wonders whether bargaining can be revived, there are some things that might be worth considering. The first concerns the better off overall test. As I say, many problems arise because employers include rolled up rates in agreements. Perhaps this is trying to solve at the agreement level a problem which is better tackled at the award level. Perhaps a standard award clause would be useful. It could prescribe the circumstances in which rolled up rates could be used. The second suggestion is that once approved, enterprise agreements should not be susceptible to challenge. The Commission's awards and instruments were once protected by pervasive provisions in the legislation. Although a jurisdictional challenge could never be entirely excluded, a pervasive provision contributed to the certainty of Commission decisions. I think such a proposal uh, merits further consideration. And finally, one wonders whether there is any way to further streamline the approval process. I know this is a matter of priority for the Commission, and I accept that it is best placed to answer this question. I now want to turn to enforcement of industrial laws. This has become a very important area. An active Fair Work Ombudsman has heightened awareness of legal obligations and prompted many corporations to audit their pay systems. The Fair Work Ombudsman also provides an avenue for enforcement, which is cheaper and more efficient than traditional litigation. The result is that detection of breaches is the highest it has been in living memory. The FWO, with assistance from the Centre for Employment and Labor Relations Law at the Melbourne Law School, has developed some innovative approaches to award enforcement in complex corporate structures. For example, the FWO now seeks to deal with employers 
in relation to entities further up the supply chain and promotes arrangements by which franchisors place obligations on their franchisees. The scale of underpayments detected in recent years, perhaps counterintuitively, is massive. A number of large employers, many with public profiles emphasising their respectability, have had to admit to significant breaches of industrial law and repay many millions of dollars. The term wage theft has been used to cover both innocent and deliberate underpayments. While there are undoubtedly cases in the former category, there are also many cases of innocent mistake. In a number of cases, underpayments have arisen because of confusion about the application of awards to employees who are treated as managers or non-award staff. It would be useful to explore ways of clearly delineating the effect of awards on employees of this type. For example, there should be a re-examination of the use of exemption provisions in awards. Exemption provisions exclude employees paid above a certain level from some or all of the award provisions relating to wages and hours. The Commission indicated a preference for this approach in clerical awards in the early stages of award modernisation, but the government amended the award modernisation request to block that initiative. There might be great benefit in reducing award regulation in relation to employees who are paid way above any wage rate prescribed by an award. Exemption provisions might also assist in resolving a significant problem in the approval of enterprise agreements by reducing complexity in the application of the better off overall test. Another measure which could assist in clarifying award obligations and reducing the burden of regulation is legislative action to confirm that award provisions concerning remuneration are true minimum provisions. This would require legislative action, including to overrule authorities based on the case of Paletti against ECOB. It would take too much to time here to deal with the issues in Paletti. For present purposes, the important issue was whether in a case relating to award obligations, the employer could set off certain overpayments against underpayments. Payments described by the employer as being in respect of annual leave were found to be in excess of award entitlements. The court found that the employer could not set off the, the excess annual leave pay against underpayment of award obligations in relation to overtime. The effect of the decision was to give the employee a windfall gain at the employer's expense. Wherever award payments are made, their effectiveness in satisfying award obligations should not be dependent on the label given to them by the employer or by the employer and the employee gently, uh, jointly. The question should simply be whether looking at the employee's pay overall, he or she is receiving at least as much as the award entitlements. The same should apply where the source of the obligation to pay is in a statute rather than an award. Turning to another contemporary issue, there is a growing concern, not a recent one it must be said, about the lack of security of employment in particular modes of employment. These modes of employment include platform or gig work, long-term casual employment, fixed-term contracts, sham contracts and so on. Looking particularly at gig work, the term employment is used in the broad sense because as we know, the legal nature of the relationship between the parties is contestable and the relationships themselves can be hard to identify. For example, the worker may be an employee or a contractor in relation to the work provider and where, where the work involves the provision of a service, the relationship between the worker and the consumer of the service might also be relevant. Whether a gig worker is an employee is a question with economic consequences for the putative employer and employee. The additional labour costs under awards and legislation are considerable and in some cases might have an impact on the work provider's business model. From the worker's perspective, 
employee entitlements are obviously more beneficial than those attaching to contract work. Whether the number of gig workers as a proportion of the workforce is sufficiently large to pose a serious threat to more conventional ways of working is an important question to which I do not have an answer. Platform work suits some people. It can be performed at times which are convenient to the worker who may have another full or part-time job. At the same time, the possibility of exploitation of workers who would otherwise be entitled to a range of benefits under awards and legislation is real. What is crystal clear is that without legislative intervention, this kind of work will remain largely unregulated and its status subject to legal doubt. With various court rulings from time to time providing only some measure of certainty. Commonwealth legislative power has limits, but the corporation's power should provide an adequate foundation to deal with gig work generally. Casual employment has often been resisted by the union movement as a matter of principle because of the relative lack of security entailed in it. There are also objections to casuals being employed for other than a short period. Many types of restrictions came to be included in awards, uh, perhaps the result of hard lessons learned during the two world wars and the Great Depression. Those provisions included prohibitive loadings of 33.3%, limitations on the number of casuals, and occasionally a complete prohibition on casual employment. Nowadays, most modern awards have standard provisions for casual employment, which seem well suited to employer and employee needs. The full federal court in two recent cases has found that employees who had been engaged on a casual basis, but with a regular and predictable pattern of working hours over a number of years, were not casual employees for the purposes of the national employment standards. The consequence of this finding was that the employees were entitled to annual leave, personal leave and other NES entitlements, despite having been paid a casual loading of 25%. Because of the long-standing and widespread employment of casuals on a semi-permanent or permanent basis, these decisions have major economic implications in terms of past underpayments and future labour costs. The concept of an employee who is engaged as a casual, but who works full-time over long periods, sometimes more than 12 months, is well accepted in industrial relations in Australia. Historically, employees paid a casual loading have been regarded as casuals despite the permanent or semi-permanent nature of their engagement. Around 20 years ago, a full bench of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission dealt with an application by unions in the manufacturing and metal industries for a provision to be included in the Metal Industry Award giving casual employers an option to convert to permanent employment after being employed for a certain length of time by the one employer. The full bench found that long-term casual employment was common in the area covered by the Metal Industry Award. Despite their circumstances of employment being in many respects the same as permanent employees, such employees were still casual. The only material distinction between the two types of employees was that the casuals did not receive annual and other kinds of leave, but were paid a casual loading to compensate them for those entitlements. In that case, the full bench decided to vary the award by including a provision which entitled casual employees engaged for a period of 12 months to convert to permanent employment. The full bench also established a standard casual loading of 25% of ordinary pay. In doing so, it set out a list of foregone entitlements and put a value on each. Those foregone entitlements included the various types of leave entitlements, which are now found in the national employment standards. The approach of the full federal court is clearly inconsistent with the way the commission has dealt with casual employment in its awards and decisions. It's to be hoped the high court resolves this issue in a way which recognises generations of practice sanctioned by the Commission. Whether and if so, what other restrictions should be placed on casual employment 
are matters which the Fair Work Commission is best able to decide in the absence of agreement. I want to conclude with some brief comments about the system overall. Our industrial relations system provides a good level of protection for award employees, particularly the lowest paid. There are obviously issues concerning insecure employment, which have been there for a long time. On the other hand, from an economic viewpoint, the system has proven flexible enough the economy to adjust to the current recession and the squeeze on business incomes. Assisted material, I might say, material, I might say by government transfers. There are many areas in which change is desirable and I've touched on some of them tonight. As important as the need for change is, however, the process for change is equally important. Business, as well as employees, should put a high value on stability and predictability. So far as practicable, change should be agreed by employers and unions with government a necessary third party. This also implies a package approach in which gains in one area are offset against concessions in others. So it is my hope that the process the government has embarked upon results in a high degree of consensus there are too many examples of failed attempts at legislation or successful attempts which are subsequently reversed. Arriving at consensus requires compromise on all sides with a shared objective of reaching a durable agreement. Without consensus, any change which is achieved is unlikely to be enduring. Thank you very much for your attendance and for your attention. And uh, I think that uh, there's going to be an opportunity for questions. And if the technology doesn't defeat me, I'll, uh, I'll attempt to answer them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. And of course, if people do want to ask questions, if you just put them into the Q&A box and, uh, and we'll take them from there. Yes. All right. Well, the first question is from Paul Half. Uh, and it is this, do the Australian systems of IR assist the competitiveness Australia, of Australian industry or do more laissez-faire employer-employee focused approach provide greater benefit? Um, it, it, it's a very important question, Paul. Um, I'll attempt to answer it in this way. Um, I think that I made some earlier remarks about the economic su success of, that Australia's enjoyed in the last 25 years. And uh, during that period, uh, we had the system pretty much as we have it today. There were some differences during the uh, period of the Australian workplace agreements, uh, but the bargaining system uh, was pretty much as it is now. So that was consistent with uh, a fairly successful economic result. Um, but there is room for a loosening of the uh, industrial relations system in the area I referred to as uh, the above award area where the market is effectively setting rates for employees way above the safety net provided by the national employment standards and the award system. I, I think in that area, as I indicated, there's, there's probably a strong case for um, introducing some kind of exemption provisions in awards, which uh, uh, would free up those higher paid areas. I think that in the lower paid areas, I would proceed with great caution. Um, uh, I think we have a fairly good balance between protections for employees in the award area and for uh, some kind of uh, flexibility, the sorts of things which have permitted employers to uh, shed labour during the current crisis uh, reasonably effectively. 
Um, so I, I would not be keen to release regulation that, which is protecting people at, if you like, the bottom end of the economy, but I see a case for doing it higher up. Um, I think there is another question here. Um, um, it's a question here from Michelle Smith. Do you advocate for endless wages growth or do you anticipate wages should stabilise? Presumably you want wages growth to increase consumption opportunities. Planet Earth can't sustain endless growth. Surely wages are high enough already. Well, uh, I suppose all I can say about that is that um, uh, there are going to be different opinions about wages growth. Uh, and um, uh, certainly growth in consumption generally uh, is an issue that um, will have to be confronted in the context of changing climate and other, other matters, uh, which are highly contentious. But what I've set out is perhaps the orthodox approach to wages growth, which is that increasing the standard of living of employees uh, does flow through to a general good for society, uh, provided increases are not um, going to uh, increase uh, unemployment. Uh, There's another question here. Um, when you talk of consensus and the need for consensus, are you envisaging a role for a social contract between employers, trade unions and government? Um, I think that that is probably the logical conclusion. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I've always been an optimist about these things. Um, probably there's not a great reason for optimism to think that employers and unions are going to come together and uh, hold hands as they go into, off into the sunset. Um, but I think there is room for, for cautious optimism that um, there can be some kind of social contract. It's happened in many European countries. Um, I think there was um, a setback for uh, consensus approaches during the Accord period. Um, the Accord was a, an agreement between uh, the ACTU and the Labor government. The employers were pretty much shut out of that process and uh, the process continued for quite a long time. Um, I think that that really did uh, sour relations uh, and um, reduce the possibility of effective negotiation between the two sides. W one of the interesting things is that when we talk about tripartite approaches in Australia, we we uh, talk about unions, government and uh, employers. Tripartite approaches in some other countries are uh, unions, employers and academics. Um, so um, it depends how you see the role of government, I guess. What, what's so important about government in Australia is the relationships which the main actors seem to have developed with the two sides of politics. So I guess you're always going to need to have uh, some, uh, some government uh, involvement there. Um, a, a very good question here about gig workers and uh, picking up on my suggestion that legislation is needed. Um, and uh, the question is whether um, there should be a third category somewhere between employees and independent contractors. Uh, and the uh, question is what might such a category look like? I do think there's a great amount of merit in this suggestion, um, but how you would achieve it, I'm not sure. We don't really have a third category at the moment, uh, but perhaps there could be legislation which limits the application of awards to uh, gig workers who might be deemed to be employees. I don't think you could apply the full range of award constraints to gig work. Uh, it wouldn't be practical. But there might be some basic protections that could be enacted, uh, but at the same time, perhaps keeping gig workers out of the full 
award system. But um, there may be a number of ways to do it. But I think in general, uh, yes, there should be some kind of um, uh, more than a contractor, but less than an employee uh, treatment for gig workers. Um, there's a rather interesting question from uh, David Trenary. Given the importance of wages growth, uh, what do you consider has led to the numerous cases of underpayment of wages? Uh, are the complexity of our award system and legal nature of the system major contributors to this situation? Well, um, I, I think there's quite a bit in this question. Um, uh, there used to be specialist industrial officers and specialist uh, uh, industrial relations managers, uh, of which I was one myself many years ago, uh, where knowledge of the award system and legal obligations were given a very high priority. Uh, I don't perceive that there is the same importance given to uh, the system and the way in which it operates these days. Um, now, I may be mistaken about this, or maybe just some, uh, the consequence of uh, uh, advancing age that uh, things aren't as good as they used to be. But I, I do think there's been a downplaying of the importance of the specialisation in award obligations. But I think the system is too complex. Um, before 2010, we had many thousands of awards. We got that down to 122 or three. Um, and uh, it wasn't long before people said the system is still too complex. We need to rationalise the number of awards. Uh, and uh, there's probably some truth in that. Um, and uh, But if you're going to have entitlements, uh, and you're going to permit parties and the Commission to mould the way those entitlements are paid to the needs of a particular industry, then uh, you're going to inevitably end up with rulemaking, which defines uh, when people are entitled to various things. So I think, yes, it's complex, but reducing it in complexity it might have some problems as well, uh, some unintended consequences but efforts should be made to do so. I know that the Fair Work Commission has been working very hard on plain language drafting of awards, and uh, that's not always met with universal acceptance from the parties who are very uh, wedded to some of their traditional ways of doing things. But I think that effort is to be applauded and uh, hopefully it will flourish. Um, the uh, the uh, next question is about the notice advantage test. Uh, that test applied um, prior to the Fair Work Act to decide whether or not um, enterprise agreements were undercutting award conditions. If it was found that they were, then um, uh, the agreement, the enterprise agreement would not be approved by the Commission. Uh, now the test is the better off overall test. Um, question is whether I have a strong view about it. No, I don't. I think that the problem in both cases is the issue of uh, rolled up rates where uh, employers, uh, sometimes unions agree, uh, want to have a, a rate which um, removes the obligation to uh, calculate in detail working hours, overtime and other entitlements and in instead comes up with one si single rate per hour. Uh, whether that in fact is an adequate rate in terms of award entitlements is uh, a common problem, whether it's a notice advantage test or the better off overall test. <laughs> um, 
is a question here from uh, uh, Ian Renard. Is there scope for a further trade-off between minimum salary increases and further employer support for superannuation? Um, I, I think that um, this is really a, a matter that can only be um, decided by the parties themselves. Uh, as the question suggests, it is very much a trade-off. And uh, the, the conditions of the current uh, pandemic and recession um, really uh, might be said to um, militate against any trade-off against salary. Um, but um, uh, this is a this is a pretty contentious issue, which I don't have a don't have an answer for. Um, and now there's a question about the. Um, about compulsory arbitration, I, I seem to have started something off here. Um, the question is, is it desirable to reintroduce compulsory arbitration of both award and agreement disputes? Um, I've been fairly cautious in the way I've dealt with this issue. I think that, that there is certainly scope for more compulsory arbitration, but um, I think it's an area that really requires the agreement of all parties. I wouldn't like to say that it should be reintroduced for all an agreement disputes, um, although that might be the outcome of, uh, of discussions. Um, just, just while you're uh, getting the next question, I just wanted to alert participants. We have got a number of questions already in the Q and A uh, question bank. So perhaps, if it's okay, we might just let um, Jeff answer those questions, and then we might bring this evening's event to a close. But there's been some really stimulating questions asked, and we're very grateful for that. So, Jeff, I'll um, I'll hand over to you if you're willing to, to keep answering the ones we've got, and then we might um, wrap things up if that's okay. Yes. Um, the um, next question then is from Andy Lynch. Uh, is the Fair Work Commission properly equipped to conciliate small claims disputes and do you think it would be appropriate, useful for it to be vested with the power to exercise non-binding determinations for underpayment claims? Um, I, I think that this is a useful power the Commission could be given. The um, many employers are using the services of former members of the commission. Uh, um, Commissioner Harrison, some people might remember, has been doing it for one, one of the large corporates. Um, so um, I think it is certainly a useful power the commission could exercise and uh, might assist employers who uh, are effectively looking for guidance as to uh, what they should do in the face of uh, particular claims. The uh, question from Tess Masters, the ACT has called for the Australian government to ratify the ILO's new convention that recognises the right to be free from violence and harassment at work. Is this needed? How would this be practically any different from existing protections? Well, I think really uh, on something like this, I'd have to defer to my colleague uh, at the Centre for Employment and, and Labor Relations or in uh, at the University of Melbourne, Beth Gaze, who's a real expert on this. Uh, but I think the question of violence and harassment at work has been brought to the surface in recent years. Uh, there are still issues, no doubt, with uh, how one deals with a complainant who uh, has a clear credibility to their complaint, but who doesn't want to be identified. Um, you know, th this poses difficult questions for employers. Um, and um, I would think that more and more debate is necessary about the ways in which uh, the workplace can be made safer for employees of um, all genders, of course. And uh, but I don't think I can really comment on the specific differences. 
Um, I think there might be one more here, uh, Cam. Um, uh, there, question there from Rosie Proctor. That's correct. I understand uh, from Rosie Proctor. I understand the ALRC is investigating how to establish wage theft as an anti-competitive practice, as well as options of private enforcement. What are your thoughts on expanding current avenues, that is beyond relying on economic torts and prospects of success for businesses wishing to pursue actions against rivals who've committed wage theft? Well, I, I'm. Um, I wouldn't place a lot of um, uh, hope in uh, the uh, legislative um, solution that is being suggested here. Um, I, I, I do think that um, there's a possibility to try and um, influence or ask the Fair Work Ombudsman to take action where it's clear that there are problems. Uh, I'm not aware of the Ombudsman's attitude to this, but um, I would have thought that if there is evidence of uh, wage theft, whether innocent or not, uh, then um, the Ombudsman would act. But uh, as I say, it's, it's not something which uh, think is going to have um, a quick legislative response of the kind that the question implies. I think we might have reached the end, uh, Cam. Uh, look, we have. And so just formally on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to just extend our gratitude and thanks to Jeffrey Judichet AO for delivering such a stimulating and wonderful lecture tonight. I think the timing couldn't have been better in light of the process, which of course is currently ongoing um, in relation to the consultations, which may give rise to amendments to Australia's industrial relations laws. Um, certainly there's some fruitful ideas in there for policymakers. And of course, as many of you will know, um, this is our, our 60th anniversary here at the ANU College of Law and so a terrific topic for that anniversary and a very scholarly lecture given by um, Jeff Judichet on this occasion. And I guess I'd also like to, to um, just uh, elucidate too how fitting I think it was that, um, that uh, Jeff gave the Philippa Weeks lecture tonight because Philippa herself, I'm told, uh, I, I unfortunately never had the privilege of meeting Philippa, but I was informed that she was not only a wonderful scholar, but also a kind and generous and wonderful human being. And as you've seen tonight, um, Jeff Judichet is, of course, a very erudite and um, excellent practitioner in this field. But I can say, having dealt with many serving and former judicial officers that none have been as pleasurable or as good to deal with as, as Jeff has been in arranging this lecture. So um, I think that it's a, a terrific honor for us to have had him deliver the lecture tonight. So thank you very much to everybody and um, keep an eye out of course for future ANU College of Law events. My pleasure.